recap series of the candidates. I'm going to recap the uh, round number 9 today and we will do the predictions for the round 10. So let's go right into this. Before actually going to the recaps, I think there are some very interesting statistics um, we have to show you guys. One of the statistics that in this tournament, as you can see, the top players are rated 2743, 2758, 2747. The highest rated guys like Nakamura, 89, Karana, 2800, and Adirizar 2700, they are not at the top. Okay. Um, of course, Nak losing both games to Vidit is uh, kind of anomaly, which shows uh, he's doing fine against other guys. But still, we can see that the ratings here are don't really uh, show the true strength of the players. And that returns to the question that most of the ratings that high players have, they are inflated and artificially kept at the same level because they play each other pretty much um, and uh, and that's how they keep their ratings and the other guys, they have to climb through the opens, they have to climb through the qualifiers and uh, only now, once they get into the top, that's they get the chance that's where they get the chance to get those ratings up alright okay um, so that being uh, said, let's go to the games. Um, all right, let's do it from the left to right. We have the Vidit versus Nakamura game. Uh, it was a disaster for the American, but this time the disaster came not from the opening, which he did okay. He plays h6 and borrows this um, from the uh, Vidit uh, book uh, from last game, where Vidit, I mean, from the uh, Gukish. Uh, game from previous day where Gukesh was black defeated to Vidit. Um, and it's kind of interesting that Vidit actually repeats the Italian. He is not scared. That's breaking the chess tradition mostly where if you lose in certain opening, you, you gotta switch it. But not in the Vidit uh, case. Okay. So castles. And now bishop e7 is pretty normal. Leads to quiet positions. But Naka wanted to go for blood. Uh, he felt that Vidit lost in the previous games, and um, as I mentioned before, it's not clear how psychologically stable Vidit is. Uh, so Naka decided to try to push for the aggressive uh, approach, potentially with the attack uh, on the king side. The only thing uh, needs to be said that this is not so clear how much of the attack there is. Um, it is, seems to be very aggressive, but a lot of times this is played in the situations where black has the bishop on c5 and then black goes um, to try to expand on the king side. Uh, this uh, approach with the bishop on g7 is more strategic. Uh, black is sort of gaining space. He can play g4 at some point, but in reality um, it's more to scare and the idea is to castle and maybe go for that 5 um, if, if black can manage to do that. So the big question if black can get that f5 n or not. Um, Bishop b3, logical, white prepares for the knight transfer to e3, the best square for the knight, to control these critical squares. Um, a5, okay, again, it's the engine move, pretty sure Nak uh, worked this on during his prep. Um, so knight c4, bishop e6, bishop e6 is uh, standard, but in this position I'm not so sure that uh, black really needs to play this. I, again, I think that black needs to go for this f5 thing. Um, and the other uh, plan for black is to play d5, where this pawn chain might actually be useful, because uh, you will come to play 5 anyway later. Um, then again, I think that you know something like king h8 and then knight h7, um, which is standard in the Italian game, preparing for f5 and f93, like knight e7 and then f5, I think it's more logical. Um, I don't know, let's check, like, king here, 93, right, 97, you can't really play d4 yet, maybe bishop c2, and now, for example, uh, <clears throat> you can actually try to trade this guy, knight g4, yeah, or knight g6 first, but okay, uh, let's see if knight g4 works, because of d4, um, for example, take, Take on d4 first, take on e3 is a big question, yeah. Um, I don't know. 
Yeah, the engine thinks that uh, this even this position is playable with b6 and then f5. Yeah, maybe. Um, the idea is again something like this: rook e1, h6, and then you play g4 and prevent this um, capture on e5. Uh, because if you play f5 immediately, like you know, white does something here. Ah, but he plays knight d2. Smart. Okay. So the idea is something like this. I'm thinking f5 here. And if you trade trade, trade trade, I think black should be pretty reasonable here. But you know, he has some weaknesses, but then again, um, very, 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 very unclear position. I think black is okay. So every move here is important, it's just basic ideas. Um, but okay, he plays bishop e6, which means he's gonna try to go for d5. Very solid plan, rook e1, centralization, protects the pawn. Developing move. Um, White's problem is this bishop on c1. So rook e8, but I think rook e8 is... Uh, yeah, so the comp says g4 and t5. I kind of agree with this. It makes more sense, to be honest. Um, and the trades, trades, again, um, this pawn on g4 is actually not so bad. And black is ready to go f5. 94 is a problem, right? Then you can play the b6. Uh, stopping knight c5, it's critical to keep this bishop on a6. And after knight g3, probably white is a little bit better here. So uh, he plays rook e8 first, prepares for this, h3, stops g4. Now the knight is very hard to move from here, queen d7, logical. Rook d8, black is centralized. Uh, b6, and uh, here, you know, he had the chance to play knight h5 immediately, which I don't think is critical, he protects the pawn. And basically asking white what white wants to do because if white ever plays d4 then uh, it's a trade trade on t5 here maybe even g4 and this pawn gets very very weak really fast so um so white must st stand and pretty much um, wait for black to declare his intentions and then try to go for b4 b5 maybe at some point that seems to be very logical yeah and knight h5 um so this uh, position Black is fully developed. I would say that what, what makes sense here is actually again to play something like king h8, get the rook here, and start playing very aggressive. Knight h5, knight f4 looks good, but it doesn't really do anything, especially if you play king's Indian, then you remember that knight on f4 is not that great. But g4 is, um, uh, despite looking pretty bad, leaving black with a weakness here, and potentially white can play knight h4 or f5. But again, the, this knight is pretty strong actually. Uh, black stops d4. You cannot get rid of this knight so easily, and black does open the file, and he's ready to play f5 at some point. So um, it seems like, I don't know, um, I don't know how white can play here. Um, like, for example, if g3, actually d5 now is actually pretty good also. Yeah. Thanks to all this um, pinnings. And uh, this this guy uh, is pretty weak. You know. And if knight h4, then uh, yeah, knight h4 looks good. But you can just play bishop f6 maybe because knight f5, pawn sack, uh, pawn sack looks okay for black. This is pretty important move. And black looks okay. So, <coughs> oh, sorry. So. Um, yeah, black looks very good, but he needs to do something, yeah. Okay, knight h5, also not bad. But after knight e3, the bishop trades. Um, this is a little bit passive. Yeah, a little bit passive. Knight f4 looks pretty good. Um, but yeah, but now white has control over the squares, yeah. So the big question is, do you really need to take on a2? That's another question, because sometimes you need the bishop here. And the white takes on e6, you can recapture with the pawn. But if you do that, then all these rooks makes no sense. Yeah. So black's entire plan hinges upon the ability to play d5, especially with the rook, this rook here. So to me, that's kind of weird. Uh, you play g5, sort of trying to get the game here, and then you play rook d8. So they don't really mix well, these plans. So I think that that was a problem for Nakamura. Uh, he probably did this in a hasty prep, didn't have much time to test it, the middle game transition plan. So he plays based on uh, his um, uh, intuitive thinking, but it's not so simple. Um, and yeah, Vidit actually makes mistake here. 
yeah, b4, immediately challenging the structure, and if black takes, and you have this uh, pass pawn, which is very unpleasant. But if you don't, then white wants to maybe even grab this and play c4 and hit this guy, and potentially the square for the rook. So, but Vidi plays d4, and black now has a chance to actually take over by the tactics. Actually utilizing these rooks and pieces he put into the center. You know, it's kind of weird that Naka didn't play this. I'm so surprised. Um, yeah, because uh, uh, the calculation is uh, black can just recapture the spawn back here. With knight g4. Uh, there is this very strong knight f6 and bishop f6 move. And then you take an e5 and black is a little bit better thanks to this awkward rook. Um, yeah, I mean, the tactician like Naka should, should probably see this. Uh, again, it's probably psychological after effect of the first game where he went for the tactics and blundered. But this looks a little bit different. Then again, maybe he's correct. Maybe it's not so great for, um, for, for him after this trade, yeah? Because bishop is gone, king is kind of weak. Um, and this pawn seems to be weak. But how to play exactly, yeah? The bishop is hit. If you play bishop c1, then knight c6 for sure. Knight here. I think black can just take only 5 even here, yeah. Because if knight gets to d3, it's a big problem. And a bishop here, f6. You cannot take this pawn. Double attack. Um, but if bishop moves to knight d3, and black is uh, probably close to winning, yeah. This knight on d3 is a monster. And all these pawns are gone, they actually help black to create an attack. So, yeah, so not bishop c1. Um, so you probably played b4. And now is the question, yeah, the question how black plays. Well, I think knight c6 must be played anyway. Knight g4, and uh, this is probably a critical position again. And I think after knight e5, uh, you need to play knight e5, you need to trade this knight, and uh, so this knight can get onto the game. And trades also favor black, yeah. So take, take, again, bishop g5, f6. Situation is a little bit different. Uh, and yet, it's the same, yeah. If the knight gets here, black is better. So white has this tactics. Pretty interesting. I think there's also queen d1 possibility here. Um, no, queen d1 is actually good for, for white, yeah. Just not very clear why. Okay, let's see it. Take, 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 take. Here, take on g5. Yeah, knight of seven. Okay, knight of seven is a problem. Because you trade, trade, and now white has rook and two pawns versus two knights, and uh, more importantly, white has uh, the plan where the rooks are very active and hits this weakness. So it is advantage for white. So instead of taking here, the engine finds the fg6 and sacrifices the queen. And this position is looking pretty good for black. Uh, rook and two knights versus queen and two pawns, but in this case, the knights are very strong and the rooks are uh, also good. The idea is that um, this pawn is very nice, it stops. It's not easy for white to make a pass pawn here. And the knights are very good in protecting the king, especially against the queen. And everything here is protected. So this looks very, very equal, actually. Yeah. Um, but if black can play this for a win, it's not clear. Uh, but this was definitely the line that uh, is very double-edged, and black could play this. Okay. Instead, he plays <coughs> e4. Again, makes sense. You want to increase your bishop, potentially push the pawns. But the problem with this is that now you have pronounced weakness on c7 and white can sort of hammer that, okay? Um, all right, let's see. So d5 immediately. You can play knight f4 first to get the knight to e6. The idea is you want to get the structure, okay? You want the knight on e6 and you want to prepare c5. Uh, the pawn should be on g6 normally because here it can be hit many times and lead to white's advantage, but you know, because c5 goes very fast, I think black is okay. Uh, so he plays d5, e5 must be played. And rook c8 is an important waste of time. Not waste of time, 
I mean, Druk is fine on d8. Yeah, I understand that Naka wanted to play c5. Uh, but, you know, you really need to get this knight into the game. This knight needs to be on a6 really fast. Um, after rook c1, rook a3, uh, knight g4 first. Looks uh, very strong. Because if you play c5, uh, yeah, you can even actually take if rook takes. Then you disconnect your pawns. The pawn structure is better for white. But still, some chances here. Yeah? Knight c6. Again, rook is strong. Knight goes to p4. Okay, advantage white, but it's not that big. Yeah. Um, so what happens? Rook a3 tries to get the rook here to stop this rook c5, maybe. Knight. Yeah, and black is like refuses to play the knight on a4. This is so weird, man. Knight should be on a4. Knight g4. Okay, he was afraid that knight e6 runs into knight of 6 or h4, yeah. But the thing is, black can also play this now, yeah. And this knight is actually pretty strong. Um, hitting this guy so you cannot play h4. This knight takes a lot of squares and uh, c5 is coming. So this looks very double-edged and uh, Naka would actually get the, uh, the chances to win this game, okay. Very double-edged positions. Um, white pawns are strong, but they're also potential targets if c5 happens and this uh, pawn is removed. Yeah, this is a very difficult position to understand, but seems to be black is okay. After c5, take uh, queen to d1. Hmm. Rook takes, seems logical. Finally, knight gets here, but after b4, now we see the problem. The problem is, um, again, the rook connects the square. Uh, queen is protecting squares. And you cannot really take this, yeah? That's the biggest problem. You cannot really take this because bishop gets this nice square. It's still okay. Yeah, knight f5. Knight f5 because you take on d5, trade, trade, and... Um, Probably even take. Probably even this. Uh, if you take with a pawn, then you have this um, thing here, and also black can play like this. Rook c6, <clears throat> and it's just drawn. Again, very logical result. Both sides played well. Uh, massive trades, yeah. Uh, instead, Naka does what, what does he do? He plays. No, he, he plays this. Okay, take. Oh, he gives up this pawn, right? Instead of taking on b4, just moving back. So he plays knight c6, logical, and now he plays knight e5, which is a huge blunder. Yeah, he just blundered. He has half an hour on his clock. He played this with five minutes thinking, and now he played this instantly, yeah? Blundering stuff. Yeah, which is very unusual for Nakamura. He doesn't usually blunder stuff. But, yeah, I actually noticed on some title Tuesdays, he'd been blundering, actually. But you prepare first. Rook cd8. Now you're threatening to take, forcing knight g4, and then t4, bishop d2, and um, yeah, knight g6. Probably white is still better because he's got this nice pawn. You can actually play this. But, you know, black <clears throat> does recapture this guy. He has, and then he'll have equal number of pawns. White is a little bit better. He has um, outside passer, strong bishop, potentially weak king. It's a lot of game here. It's a lot of game here. Instead, he takes on um, e5. It's kind of incredible because after knight e5, he just pawned down, and no compensation is actually uh, much worse. And he had to take with the queen here, I think, uh, because after knight e5, after this move, rook d3, he is uh, allowing rook d6, and um, knight goes to g4. And not only he is pawned down, but he's also lost uh, because his king is under attack. Yes, it's, it's, it's amazing how in two moves his entire position just became lost. Just completely lost, man. Yeah, it's gone. Queen f5, game is over. Yeah, it's, it's incredible. Yeah, he played really well at the middle game, and then he had a lot of time on his clock, and he just blitzed out the move and blundered. Very unusual. Uh, must be some something psychological, I guess. Something psychological. All right. 
That was game number one. Then we have this um, All Indian Affair. By the way, I have to tell you guys um, that we have three Indians in this tournament. But the leader, Gukesh, right? He managed to win his mini match versus Prague, one half against half. But he also beat Vidit, one half and half, okay? This shows that he's the strongest Indian in this tournament. So, he is leading uh, fully deserved. All right. All right, so very solid Spanish. Um, D3 against uh, open Spanish, which is uh, played by a lot of Indians, and they know those lines, uh, which usually lead to a draw. So Gukish plays D3, wants to keep his chances alive for an advantage. Bishop C5 immediately, which is correct. Um, because now if white wants to play c3, d4, he's going to waste the tempo. And bishop on c5 is much better than bishop on e7. Here is more passive, more aggressive. Uh, simple explanation, yeah. So now it takes on c6 and white wants to go into this structure uh, because there's some game left here. And also the c3 move. Um, very unusual. White wants usually to keep this pawn structure intact, especially against a pair of bishops. But then again, for some reason, everybody against uh, uh, Prague wants to play these structures and he keeps demonstrating that he understands the structures really well. Uh, yeah, White's plan to play d4 is not actually uh, that good because um, any opening of the position favors the side with the pair of bishops. And if you really play d4, then this bishop becomes really active. Um, so not recommended, okay? Bishop d6, solid, prepares for potential c5, stops d4, knight d2. Um, a5 first, okay, um, I don't know, there's nothing wrong with c5 in my opinion, but okay. I'm not the specialist on this line, um, Prague seems to be one of the specialists here. Knight d7, for some reason black declines to castle, probably worried about d4, e5, and uh, uh, if he takes then e5, but if he doesn't then there's some trades and white can go into the structure, I don't know, let's see it, uh, castles d4, uh, and now you have to play this, and white can play knight c4 or probably rook e1 first. I was just thinking maybe you can take here and play this, but normally this position is um, okay for black. So queen e7, again a pair of bishops, um, and how to play here for white, yeah. There's some lines in the Spanish exchange line where black later plays f5 here. To make sure he gets the light squares and um, yeah black seems to be fine especially with the pawn on c3 this is kind of weakness for the future invasion for the queen rook and uh, again opening the position favors uh, black so but okay he plays knight d7 it's fine actually program move um, you can now play f6 so the knight goes to e6 or just c5 knight protects all these squares so knight c4 solid b6, also very solid, potentially bishop can go to a6, either trade the knight with the instant draw, or bishop can go to b7 and go for the f5 plan, which is more aggressive. So, and white just takes on d6. Okay, so Kukish in this game, he doesn't want to take too many risks, he plays for a minimal advantage. Um, I'm not sure about knight f6 though, f6 looks very logical, uh, but knight f6, Prague is saying, you know, I think you have a zero advantage, knight d2, threatening f4, forces h6, yep, bishop e3 back. Um, and now the, the, the question is, is there f4 or there is no f4, yeah? Yeah, uh, bishop a6, okay, accurate, making sure white uh, does something about this guy first. Queen c2, okay, knight d7 back. So you see the problem, right? Black plays knight f6, knight d7, knight f6 back, and knight d7 back. That's a lot of tempi, a lot of tempi, right? During which time he could have easily castled and uh, played something like c5, and this is a very draw, very much like a draw. f4 is reasonable, why not? And take on f4, but taking on f4 um, is kind of giving white a small advantage, yeah? Because now white gets the center. The thing is, um, the opposite color bishops, um, have great drawing tendencies when there are queens off the board. But when the queens are on the board, 
the side that has an attacking chance has a great attack because the defending bishop cannot counter the attacking bishop. Okay, the problem with this, um, yeah, bishop e4, yeah, th this seems a little bit illogical. Um, I was expecting rook f4 here, doubling the rooks, c4, bishop to the central, pile, and then you maneuver the knight. Okay, yeah. or maybe c4, bishop d4, knight f1, knight g3, and then rook f1, okay? Because uh, then uh, this is actually pretty unpleasant pressure along that file, and white gets the square. So black must be pretty careful here. Yeah, the computer actually agrees, but he says it after castle, knight f1, there is d5, and uh, white must play knight g3, the idea of knight f5, and black must be very, very careful here, because if you take on a4, knight f5, and as mentioned before, white's attack is now very, very strong. Rook g4 is a threat, knight e5, but if you play knight e5, then you lose the pawn. But already rook g4 is a very, very strong threat here. So black, yeah, this is pretty dangerous. So I don't, I don't understand why Gukic didn't take on a4 with the, bishop, uh, with the rook. He takes with the bishop, and the bishop also not that well placed here. Maybe he wants to play knight e3, d4, e5, also makes sense, but he closes the rook. Um, here, rook e1, okay. Again, just minimal advantage. Rook e3, right? Rook e3, rook g3. White is stronger here. He needs to create some threats, man. c4 is very academic. And uh, allows also black the chance to, you know, simplify the position by making uh, trades. Yeah. Again, it, it must be something that, um, you know... Um, Gukish probably didn't want to take too many risks against Prague. Uh, if, knight, if white knight is only three, he is much better. Okay. Uh, bishop g3. Okay, looks solid. Queen d7. The engine suggests e5, but I think that's nothing. Knight h2 goes to g4. I like a4. Black is just trying to trade everything, and he needs to get this bishop here to trade this knight. Okay. So knight g4. Okay, advantage white, but bishop? I, I haven't seen this game before. So I'm watching it right now for the first time, and these are my first impressions. But my impression is that white is definitely doing better here. Again, knight goes to e3, black probably wants to play knight e7, f6, and just stop the knight trade. Now that the pawns are traded, black rook is active, he can actually try to you know, double the rooks and start trading heavy pieces. If uh, heavy pieces are traded, Black is absolutely fine. Rook b1 with idea rook b6. Yeah, I notice a lot in this tournament Gukish tries to invade with his rooks on the open files, like he beat Vidit with black. He invaded uh, along the a file. I mean, it's reasonable. Uh, the rook is not doing much on the e file anyway. And, uh, okay, queen f2, bishop c8. Black is finally moving the bishop here. Rook protects this weakness. Everything is protected. And queen a7, just in time, right? Just in time before knight rises to f5, and black is ready to play rook a2, create some active counterplay. And yeah, I think knight f5 should be played anyway. Um, and the point is, uh, if black plays like this, and you can take take knight e3, and now knight goes to d5. If you trade this knight, white gets protected pass pawn in the center. Okay, advantage white. But if you don't take this knight, knight uh, creates a lot of threats, especially to the king. So black probably must take this knight on d5, all right? This is extremely unpleasant position uh, for black. Rook a3, and uh, the big question is uh, why I cannot take this pawn? Why I cannot take this pawn? Very interesting. Rook a1 makes sense, attacking. And rook a3 is not good because of, oh, because of check. Check here, you cannot go here, knight g6, and a king h7, knight c8, queen f5. All right, tactical idea, yeah, tactical idea. Uh, but if you cannot take this pawn, bishop e6, yeah, I, st I still think this is a little bit unpleasant for, for black, also rook f3 is coming. Again, this knight is very, very strong. So, a little advantage for white. But he plays rook b2. Okay, 
logical. King h2 improves his position a little bit. Rook a3, counterattack. Queen e2, there should be a 6, everything. But now black is almost fully okay. He protects both squares. Knight takes care of these squares. Um, the game starts to look like a draw. So rook b1, we got the trades. Uh, f6, again very solid. Queen goes to b2. And black finally takes this knight and um, white takes, he takes with a pawn. So queen e7, everything's protected. And the game was a draw. All right, um, very solid game. Gukish had some chances, but um, he didn't want to take too much risk. But he did have chances, okay? He could have taken a four with the rook and put the knight on a five sooner. Also, black had a lot of uh, weak pawns on the queen side. And Gukish, you know, was a little bit slow, allowed Black to trade all those weaknesses and, uh, you know, make things easier for Prague. All right, this was the interesting game of the, of the, of the round. Um, there, there is, apparently, there is a controversy with Adresa receiving a message from Arbiter from Mr. Abbasov, who said that um, Mr. Adresa's shoes are making too much noise. Wow, okay. If we do remember, a previous controversy involved uh, Arbiter with Larisa was in Vikanzia. It was the last round of the tournament. The game was running late and the Arbiters uh, wanted to prepare for the closing ceremony. So they asked Larisa during his game to move his table so they can prepare for the closing ceremony. Even though the game was still played and Larisa had a chance uh, to, you know, to compete for the first place. All right. It's incredible, actually, you know, that uh, in that crucial game with this limited time, you know, players concentrated trying to find best moves and the arbiters just tapping on the shoulder and say, excuse me, we need to move your table, man. Yeah, that's kind of crazy. Um, but in this tournament, you know, the arbiter talking to him about his shoes is very interesting. Um, but apparently, you know, the request came from Mr. Abbasov, yeah, so he complained about the noise and the only way the player can complain, he can't talk to another player directly. So he must go through the Arbiter, right? So Arbiter was simply translating uh, the request from Mr. Abbasov, except that uh, the Arbiter could make his own decisions, right? Uh, I mean, what's the point of talking to others uh, during the game about the shoes? You know, he's not gonna change the shoes in the middle of the game, right? It makes a lot more sense for the Arbiter to talk to guy after the game okay so i think that that was clearly clearly not correct way uh, for the arbiter to approach this um, problem because the player should not be you know contacted during the game i understand that uh, abasa was probably disturbed also during his game but you can't seriously expect the player like uh to get the shoes during the game man even if he has a pair of shoes, like, you know, but I really doubt it. Uh, and also, how come only his shoes are making uh, the noise? Aren't there, like, ladies also present in the tournament hall, right? There's, like, so many people there. And I'm pretty sure, like, uh, it's actually been a problem in the previous candidates. Players have been complaining that the stage itself uh, was kind of... Uh, the wood was kind of, you know, making uh, the sound effect after the players just walking. It doesn't matter which shoes they were. It was just the quality of the stage, okay? So maybe it's the stage also, yeah? I don't know. We, we, we'll, we, we'll hopefully get some more information about what's going on there. But one of the things that, uh, you know, if it is the shoes problem, then the arbiter should talk to others after the game. Okay, if it was something about the sneezing, coughing, uh, or like, you know, talking loudly or something, or something other distracting that can be changed during the game, then okay, you can, you can probably talk about that, yeah. But, you know, shoes, like really? What do you want him to do, to walk without shoes on the stage? Really? Okay, yeah, that, I, I think that's just wrong, man. All right, so the game, uh, we have, B3, specialty of Nakamura. He plays this in the title of Tuesdays, yeah? And now we see this at the highest level in the candidates. Bishop F5, that's how I play against Naka. 
I usually play e6 here, but c5, knight c6, and black plays very aggressively, goes for the uh, pawn center grab. Uh, this is also really known with reverse colors, like King's Indian stuff. And uh, bishop e7. I like to play h6 and put the bishop on h7 immediately. And as we can see later in the game, that is kind of the case, but he does this. Uh, rook e1, h6, bishop h7. So this is an improvement on the London. The London we have c6, knight d7 set up. Uh, but c5, d5 is more aggressive because now black has a choice to close this bishop and actually put the game into the King's Indian reversed uh, mode where the bishop on b2 is not that great. Although, you know, uh, it looks very, very equalish, but why is slightly better, especially after this knight trade? Because the bishop is now open and black bishop is actually closed on h7, okay? That's one of the nightmare things about the London, again reversed, is that the bishop on h2 is closed a lot and is, while well, this bishop is have potential targets here. So the big problem for black what to do here. It's kind of funny that Nepo plays this pretty fast in the blitz tempo. He doesn't take this uh, seriously. And then he starts to make this moves like this. Played in within one minute. Okay. Because anybody who plays London, he knows that you have to play bishop f6 here. Because the bishop trade, first of all, favors uh, the side uh, that has the pawns on the opposite color of the bishop, right? Um, if you trade here, knight of six, there is nothing here. No attack, nothing. Um, because these pawns are kind of weak. So white has to play e5. But now this bishop is closed and this bishop is open. And black has potential uh, b5, c4 coming. The computer says that after c4, um, black is worse. A little bit, but not much. Um, but actually this is interesting. This is actually not clear, yeah, because there's a lot of space for white and uh, probably white is better, yeah, white is a little bit better here, but not too much, yeah. Uh, black plan is to transfer this knight later. Right now he does a good job protecting this guy, but later the knight can go to either c7, a6, b4, or he can go to back somewhere into the c6 square and trying to get to b4 hit this guy yeah so this is this is very double edged position you really need to analyze this it has to be precise it's not easy for white to make an attack yeah because the square is protected so he'll have to switch the game to the center or something right but bishop f6 is uh, fully expected d4 here um, is not that good, okay? Because in the King's Indian, bishop on h7 is a really bad idea. This bishop must be on this diagonal or on this square to help uh, with the c4, b5 breaks, okay? I like a4, forces black to play a6, b6 before he can do b5, because if you play a6, there is a5 in this connection, and now white is just better, okay? Uh, instead, he plays a5 and now f4. And now we have the King's Indian with the bishop on h7, which is absolutely terrible. All right? Advantage white, for sure. Bishop h3, I like, uh, creating threats. Rook e8. We, okay, knight c4, good. Uh, bishop d6. Bishop c1, also very logical. White's attack is coming really fast. He, he's just gonna play f5. Um, the only thing about bishop h3 is that this bishop prevents the pawn movement. And this bishop does absolutely nothing to protect the king. He's actually in the way. So that's a big problem for black. All right, um, queen c6. And um, I, don't, I don't like this trade, yeah? Because white needs these pieces to attack the king. The only, the, so this is critical position. Uh, Napo playing fast, trying to force al resign to time trouble, so al resign makes a mistake. But strategically, white is much, much better here, and he needs to find the correct plan. So what is the correct plan? So the engine suggests getting rid of this bishop so you can start pushing these guys. Uh, the human way to play this would be to play bishop d2, but there is this f5 move, um, the whole point of the queen c6. 
but now you can take here now you can take here and take here and you have a pair of bishops potentially you play queen d5 go into the end game black is in for a lot of trouble okay pair of bishops is very very strong especially in this open position so that is definitely one possibility instead of f5 black can maybe play bishop c7 uh, but it's the same thing right so this is probably the critical line and we have to find out if this is um, something or nothing g4 Napoleon king ran away here but if you run right now there is this b4 plan and white can easily open the position if you play a6 there is this very nice idea to play a5 and knight b6 the whole point is you grab one of the bishops and if uh, he takes the knight otherwise knight gets to t5 if you try to win the pawn nobody cares about this pawn because there is this very strong attack coming okay very very strong attack um and this bishop is really in the, in the wrong place in the wrong time so if you play like nepo did king of seven king of seven now white can actually play this and this bishop has no moves and now white can play bishop a5 and prepare for the pawn break uh, here <coughs> because bishop has no moves okay or um probably you can just take this guy yeah take this guy and then prepare rook g1 queen h5 uh, and uh, get this pass pawn here which should lead to which should lead to an advantage for because bishop g8 runs into this now you have to close the bishop rook g1 uh, <coughs> rook h7 runs into this problem take take king now stuck to protecting the pawn goes to h6 which forces bishop to the bad position h7 because the pawn is right there okay so let's grab i think h5 and um, it's kind of curious position both bishops are closed but white's bishop is doing something black bishop is just a big pawn so this looks like a winning advantage for white uh, if black doesn't run with the king here then he must run with the king here um, then you probably prepare g5 so that you don't run into some problems like this okay thanks to the spin so queen g3 first or rook e2 i like king h2 because white doesn't have to rush now that the queen takes off the edge you play g5 um but g6 yeah so that's that's the thing that's why you need to move the queen or play rook g1 first actually prepare g5 because black is not playing g6 anytime soon if you play c4 the bishop can actually go here be activated and now you play g5 and this is very close to being lost for for black yeah look at this bishop man yeah that's what i said in the london system you have this bishop f4 h2 and that's why the attack on the king side is very strong and this is the same way see white is winning here white is winning because this king and this bishop they are like in the wrong place wrong time Queen's coming, Rook is coming, tripling on the H file, Bishop diff. Yeah. Yeah, so this this was pretty good for White. And this is exactly the middle of the game where the arbiter probably intervened. Yeah. Uh, really bad timing, man. So Bishop D2 is possible, but also take on D7 and F5, but you kinda need the knight, okay? Kinda need the knight. Because if you take on D6, take here and play F5, again, advantage white but now black is you know in time to run with the king because white pawns a little bit too far and there is no open file here and black can play a5 and close this thing here okay um the computer likes to play a5 here for this precise reason to keep the a file potentially open okay uh, king of seven king runs king is now very safe and a5 and and now there is no breakthrough and bishop goes to g8 king goes to b7 black is very very safe um, not sure about rook f1 again prepare g5 bishop g8 um, normally you know you would consider playing g6 to close both the bishop and the rook but the problem with this is that white has no way to um, break through black's defenses here 
And if you do, then the bishop gets active and he starts to hit the pawns. So the only way to play for a win is actually to take, take, and do what the other is added. Rook g6. Very nice exchange sack. Uh, rook e8. Okay. And I think bishop here is um, an accuracy. It does look like an accuracy. Um, white is probably not going to be able to break through um, here. The point is you cannot take on f6, queen g4. Wait, uh, oh, rook f8 first, okay. Yeah, I was thinking, why is that? Why is that? Because there is no check, yeah, no check. Yeah, but this is actually a critical line, maybe, yeah. Because this pawn is hanging, this pawn is now wide open, but queen g7, yeah, queen g7. If you attack, black can easily defend it. And then all the points of entry are being guarded. So yeah, <clears throat> looks equal. So even if you take this pawn, it's okay. He plays bishop e1, rook e6, and black protects this pawn now. Um, yeah. So there is no way for white to win this, yeah. But I'm curious. Um, okay, let's go back. So if queen f6, rook f8, queen h4, take, take, yeah. What if White somehow trades the queens here? Isn't that like advantage for him? But how you can trade the queens here is a big problem. Yeah, not easy. Um, not easy to trade the queens here. And you do need king here because even if you take on h6, with the black king here, rook h8, the pawn will be hanging. So you kind of need the king here. Yeah, rook f8. Bishop here, king d6, protects everything, bishop g3. Yeah, the only thing is that black can play queen f6, yeah, you push the pawn. So, uh, queen g8 maybe, and then queen goes here. Yeah, it's nothing. All right, so um, it's not enough, yeah, not enough. Nepo defends well, and uh, all his pawns are protected. White looks good, but it's not enough to win the game. Not enough to win the game, and uh, that's why the players agreed on the draw. Black has created a fortress. Okay. <clears throat> All right, a lucky escape for Nepo, and last game of the rounds, Abasa versus Fabiano. Um, yeah, this was the game where Fabi plays bishop before prep. Very interesting. Transposition to Nimzo with c6. And uh, Abasa wasn't prepared for this, and he missed e5. Now black is better in this endgame. Black is better. Okay, white has better bishops, but the bishop are bad. Knight d3, trade, trade, bishop b2. Opposite color bishop endgame, where white has weaknesses, uh, weak light squares. So advantage black. But it's not easy to uh, to play this, to win. Because, yeah, I expected rook d1 actually to start trading. Knight d2 is reasonable, but it's a little bit passive. c5, logical. Knight goes to a5, creates some threats, but white can play a5 yeah, and stop this. Which is why maybe knight a6 and actually put the knight on c5. Or start doubling first, creating pressure on this guy. Yeah, I think doubling the rooks here and creating pressure on this guy is very strong. Okay, c4, knight c6. Ah, okay. Yeah, this is incredible, actually. Yeah, black can play this move. Counterintuitive, but very, very strong. The idea is this knight gets to b4, and you fix white pawns on these squares where the bishop can actually hit them. But the knight gets to b4, and closes the b-file, and uh, creates a lot of opportunities for black to hit stuff. Yeah, potential also rook d2 and bishop c4. After this, it's actually a big advantage for black. Yeah, I think, I'm pretty sure Fabi considered this, but uh, he thought he has time. But after knight c6, a5, it's done. He doesn't have time anymore. And bishop can go to c3 and now protect everything. So Fabi missed a pretty big chance to win the game. I'm actually very surprised because Fabi is very, very good in the end games. I mean, I'm so surprised he missed a5, man. Yeah, it looks uh, counterintuitive, but once you see it, and you, you see the, the whole point is to fix this pawn here, okay, potential target. 
black is just better. And after a5, well, there are no targets. White is just hitting this guy, and it's very hard to do anything. Rook b5, counter attack, knight e5, uh, trade. And now we have opposite color bishop endgame where black doesn't even have an attack. Um, okay. Rook to b7. Uh, probably the idea was to do something like this, yeah? So if rook c5, rook dd2, bishop g3, bishop g7. Okay, this is smart, yeah? The bishop goes to c6 and white has to give you this pawn. But even this, even this is very hard to win. Opposite color bishops, man. Alright, so Abbasov actually plays rook b7. Uh, he could play g4 also first, yeah? Rook b7, rook d2, bishop here, bishop or rook a6, or rook a5. Yeah, he wanted to avoid rook a5, rook b5, rook trade. He plays a6, okay. But why hits the pawn from behind? h4, very important move. Now the king will not be mated. Black's only chance is to hit this guy, but even if you take the pawn, again, opposite color bishops, black king is really also not that safe, you know. King f4, king e5, wow. Yeah, passive, like, not concerned at all. Um, he thinks just draw. Okay. And bishop d6, wow. f6, king g3, and now you already take on c5. You avoid all the potential checks. White plays very, very safe. Rook c5, and... Massive trades and a dead draw. Yeah, so Fabi only had one chance in this game. See, in a game where you have uh, very strong players, you don't get more than one chance, okay? And Fabi just missed that chance. He's not in a good form. He is probably also uh, come to the realization that he's not gonna win these candidates. And, uh, you know, when you do that, you sort of kind of give up. You know, you try to do your job good. He played well this game. And he did a good job, but, you know, he missed the opportunities, yeah? Because you're not searching for them, all right? You're not trying, because when you try to win, like, you really try to win, like, really try to crush your opponent, utilize every mistake he makes, that's what usually Fabi does, but I think he was very upset and gave up pretty much here. Um, yeah, kind of sad, to be honest. All right, that was the round number nine. Predictions for round 10 today. After this round, players finally have another rest day. Guys, we have to say that the time control is fast compared to the old candidates where you had two hours and 30 minutes to make 40 moves, and then you had another time control. You know, people used to have a lot more time than these days. These days, you know, organizers, they try to save money. So they make all these fast time controls which leads to a lot of time troubles and players making mistakes. The quality of the game suffers. I'm not very happy about it, uh, but you know, this trend is not gonna disappear. In fact, the trend to speed up the games is, uh, is actually gaining force. People try to get the tournaments faster, you know, made faster, done faster, completed faster, the game's faster, everything faster, yeah. I really don't like this trend. Uh, because chess as a whole suffers, the quality suffers. Uh, there is actually more stress on the players, more mistakes, more missed opportunities, more damaged psyches, you know. The damage to the brain is there, you just don't see it like in the boxers. In the boxers it's obvious, yeah. You see the broken noses, bleeding eyebrows, you know, stuff like that. Uh, but when your brain is hit, you don't see it, it's invisible, but it's still there. All right. Predictions for round number 10. We have Prague versus Vidit in inter-Indian affair. Um, how are they doing? Vidit is at 50% and Prague is at plus one. So Prague actually still has theoretical chance to join Kukish. And uh, Prague is playing white. So he's definitely going to try to use this opportunity. In the previous game, what happened? Uh, Prague versus Vidit. Oh! We did actually lost to Prague. Okay, so that actually is a big chance for Prague today. If he wins the game, 
again. Uh, that means uh, Vidit will be, yeah, actually there is a chance for Prague to win this. Yeah, Prague is playing very solidly. If you play solidly well, at some point, eventually you're gonna win a game, okay? So this might be just the case. Uh, Naka came from a win and then a loss, and now he plays Abbasov, yeah? Yeah, this is his chance, he knows it. But, you know, he is kind of blundering stuff, yeah? He's blundering tactics against Vidit, he blundered twice. He's playing well strategically, yeah? But he's blundering tactics, that's what happens when you get older in chess, okay? Your calculation skills, uh, it kind of this concentration, it lapses. Just the lapse for, for a second, but it's enough. Especially if Naka, he's just like, blitzes out a series of moves, right? And it was kind of incredible against Vidit, he blitzed out the series of moves. But it's candidates, man, it's not Title Tuesday. Jesus, all right? He didn't verify, he didn't check his, if he blundering something, and he did. I mean, how can you blunder the candidates when you have half an hour on the clock? Absolutely ridiculous. Yeah, you know, one day he plays fantastic chess, he demonstrates his best in the world, and the next day he starts to play like a, like a passer, man. Unbelievable. All right, his chance to win against Abbasov, yeah? But Abbasov is very strong. As the storm shows he is a good defender. Uh, has he won any games yet? Nope, he didn't win a single game. All right, so... That means probably two results. The draw white wins. Napo versus Gukesh, battle of the leaders. Napo has no reason to beat Gukesh. He's gonna try, uh, but if he's not gonna succeed and it's gonna be a draw, he, I think he'll be satisfied. But and so did and so will Gukesh. Yeah. The draw will solidify the position that both leaders have. I am actually not sure what happens if there is a draw, if there is a tie for the first place. Because using the tiebreaker to, to to decide the challenger for the World Chess Championship title does not seem like a good idea. They definitely should have a tiebreaker. I think regulations say that they will have a tiebreaker. And then we're gonna have this game Fabi versus Aliriza. Yeah, very interesting. Um, yeah, Aliriza is now playing good chess actually. Fabi is always playing good chess, but he might get uh, distracted. But now he has White. He definitely has some prep for Alariza. So this is gonna be a big test for the French player. All right. Um, and uh, it's gonna be a very interesting game today. All right, guys, uh, recap is done. And uh, tomorrow is the rest day. And it's kind of good because tomorrow is also Title Tuesday. We might actually see Nakamura play in the Title Tuesday. I will not be surprised. <laughs> Candidates in Title Tuesday, mix it, why not? And um, they're... And then I'll see you guys with the recap after that, all right? So enjoy. I put it on the YouTube and I'll see you guys um, 